to British Murders, a true crime podcast with a focus on British murder cases. My name's Stuart Blues, and I'm excited for you to join me on this journey of morbid discovery. I'm by no means an expert on the subjects of homicide and serial killers. However, I have always had a sick fascination with them. Together, we will learn about some of the lesser known British murderers, as well as glimpsing occasionally at some of the more notorious ones. The bite-sized presentation of this podcast is intentional, as we look to cover an overview of the respective timelines of each case succinctly. The location where the events in this episode unfold is one which is close to my heart. I'll give you some clues. It is a city in northern England. Fizzy drinks, also known as soda, were invented there. Lord of the Rings author J.R.R. Tolkien studied at one of the city's universities. Marks and Spencer, a major British multinational retailer, was founded there. And it is also debated that the first ever movies were filmed there. If you haven't guessed by now, I'm talking about the city of Leeds located in West Yorkshire, northwest England. Leeds is close to my heart as it's the city in which my daughter was born. It's where I've worked for almost a decade and some of my closest friends are based there. Potter Newton is a residential area of Leeds around two miles northeast of the city centre. It is situated between the rather impoverished community of Chapel Town to the south and the more affluent suburb of Chapel Allerton to the north. On May 14th, 2017, the middle class area of Chapel Allerton was shocked to the core when the body of a woman was found by morning runners near the car park of a woodland area named Adel Woods. For reference, the suburb of Adel is located around four miles northeast of Potter Newton. Adel Woods, also known as All Woodley Crags Plantation, is the home of historical landmark Adel Crag, or All Woodley Crag. A crag, if you're wondering, is just an isolated rock formation. The body was that of a 26 year old mother of four. Sinead Wooding. Sinead grew up with her dad and half-sister Natalie after deciding that she wanted to move away from her mum when she was just four. When describing how Sinead was as a child, Natalie stated that she was an energetic and fun-loving girl, however she had a fiery side which developed as she got older. Sinead's feisty personality would often land the sisters in hot water, by which I mean they were always getting into trouble. By the time Sinead was a teenager, she had decided to go and live with her sister Natalie for a few years. Not one to follow rules, Sinead soon grew tired of Natalie's house rules and the number of chores she was responsible for. This led to numerous confrontations between the sisters which eventually led to Sinead deciding that she wanted a fresh start. At the age of 17, Sinead decided to move to England's capital city of London, 200 miles southeast of Leeds. Sinead wanted to move as far away from her old life as possible. That may sound strange to my international listeners, but in England, 200 miles is considered a long way to travel. This is because of the small size of the country and in our culture it makes sense as to why we consider 200 miles to be far away. It was during her time in London that Sinead had her first two children. She had met a man there and started what she thought was her new life. Unfortunately that wasn't the case and when the relationship broke down Sinead moved back up to Leeds with her two children. As she had been when she was a child and teenager, Sinead continued her rebellious ways into adulthood. She was particularly fond of alcohol and would often lose control of herself as a result. A variety of jobs came and went upon her return to Leeds, 
including that of a hairdresser, a bricklayer, also known as a construction worker, and a mechanic. Sinead labelled herself as a bit of a tomboy, which is why she would often work jobs historically associated as being done by men only. When I say Sinead was a tomboy, I mean she was a girl who exhibited the stereotypical characteristics or behaviours of a boy. Fearing that her drinking was getting out of control and becoming a real problem, Sinead decided to convert to Islam. In the Muslim faith, alcohol, as well as other intoxicants, is prohibited as stated in the Quran, the central religious text of Islam. Sinead told her sister, Natalie, about wanting to convert to Islam. However, when questioned further as to why, Sinead simply stated that she wanted to become more disciplined and give up her drinking. It wasn't necessarily anything to do with faith or what she believed in. In 2014, after becoming involved in the Islamic community, Sinead met 27-year-old market stall worker Akshar Ali. The couple fell in love quickly, and within six months of meeting, they were married. Before long, Sinead became pregnant and the pair had their first child together. Soon after that, Sinead again became pregnant and the couple then welcomed their second child to the world. Sinead's world was now complete. She had four children whom she loved dearly. She had a husband who was not only a good father but also a fantastic provider. She had the perfect marriage and, in her head, the perfect life. Although it may have appeared to the outside world that Sinead had finally achieved what she had been looking for, behind closed doors it was a different story. Neighbours repeatedly complained about disturbances and the level of noise coming from the house, however, no official police reports were made. The blissful marriage had been damaged by alcohol fueled arguments and domestic violence, as Sinead had returned to her old habit of drinking alcohol. She had also started wearing more westernised clothing again, something which frustrated Akshar as it felt like he had lost some control. The couple eventually agreed to spend some time apart and as a result, Sinead would often take her children to a friend's house. She would stay there for a few nights to get away from the multitude of issues at home. Sinead did this often, however, she would always make sure to take the kids with her as they were all under the age of 10. These visits were typically when Sinead would confide in her friends and tell them that she wanted to end her relationship with Akshar. She was hesitant to do this, however, as she feared losing her children as a result of ending the marriage. Akshar was an extremely controlling man behind closed doors and would use the threat of taking Sinead's kids away from her as a means to coerce and control her. Akshar had even gone to the extreme of setting up CCTV cameras which were pointed at the house 24-7. If Sinead ever left the house, Akshar would be notified as the cameras would pick up the movement. He would then rush home and prevent her from leaving or going anywhere without his authority and approval. Sinead never told her family about her struggles at home with Akshar, so they were unable to help her. In April 2017, a month before Sinead's death, she stayed with her other sister, Katie, for the weekend. Again, she took the kids with her. She told Katie that she didn't want to return home. Not knowing anything about the domestic abuse occurring at Sinead's house, Katie felt that her sister was saying this simply because they had all had such a fantastic weekend together. The domestic violence escalated to the point where Sinead made a call to West Yorkshire Police on May 10th, 2017. West Yorkshire Police, or WYP as it is often initialised, is the territorial police force responsible for policing the metropolitan county of West Yorkshire. The 999 emergency call, England's equivalent of a 911 call, was made after Akshar had made several malicious phone calls to Sinead, followed by a series of vindictive text messages. In the UK, we have two emergency numbers, 999, which is used for emergencies, and 101, which is used for non-emergencies. 
I don't have access to the police call that Sinead made to 999, however, given the fact that no officers visited the property immediately, it is logical to assume that they didn't believe that her life was in danger or that the situation was classified as being an emergency. Typically, in domestic abuse cases involving things such as harassment, stalking or abusive phone calls, the police would expect a call to be made to 101 rather than 999. After speaking to the phone operator, the complaint would then be passed on to an officer who would then contact you within a day or two for some follow-up information. Following this conversation, a date would be agreed for you to visit the local police station to speak to an officer in a more official capacity. On May 11, 2017, the day after Sinead called 999, she and a friend went house hunting. Upon returning home, Sinead was told by Akshar that the whole family was attending a party later that evening at their friend's house. The friend in question was Yasmin Ahmed, who lived only a few miles away from Sinead and Akshar. As time went by and his relationship with Sinead began to deteriorate, Akshar found himself becoming closer with Yasmin. He would visit Yasmin after finishing work, before finishing the journey and returning home to Sinead and the children. Upon arriving at Yasmin's house for the party, the couple began drinking. They were the only ones at the party consuming alcohol. As it typically did at home, the drinking was followed by an argument. Feeling uncomfortable, the other guests at the party asked them to continue their heated argument in the kitchen. Everyone else remained in the living room. Shortly after the couple disappeared out of view into the kitchen, the guests heard a loud bang. As this was Yasmin's house, she went to the kitchen to check on Sinead and Akshar. Upon returning to the living room, Yasmin informed the other guests that Sinead was drunk and had simply bumped into something. That was the cause of the loud bang they had heard. Akshar then returned to the living room shortly after and explained that Sinead had stormed out. The party essentially ended at that point, with Akshar taking all of the children back home. When they arrived back home, Sinead wasn't there. Akshar didn't report Sinead as missing, as she would often disappear for a while after arguing with him. It wasn't until May 14th, 2017, three days after the party, that Sinead's absence from her children became a cause for concern. Natalie, one of Sinead's sisters, approached Akshar and asked if he had seen Sinead, to which he advised he hadn't seen her for three days. It was only then that Akshar reported Sinead as missing to the police. He informed them that he had been texting her and that the kids were extremely worried. According to UK charity Missing People, every year 176,000 people are reported missing by the police in the UK, with many going missing more than once. This is likely to be an underestimate of the actual number as not every missing person is reported to the police. When someone is reported as missing, the police will take several steps which can vary depending on the circumstances surrounding the disappearance. A missing person is generally classed as high risk if they are considered to be a danger to either themselves or the general public. Where the missing individual isn't deemed to be a risk, police will conduct a less active search. However, if the disappearance is thought to be suspicious or unexplained, a more active search will take place. Police will firstly attempt direct contact with the missing person, followed by a discussion with family members, friends and even colleagues to gain a better understanding of the situation. A house call and search of the local area may also be conducted and in the most extreme circumstances, an appeal on social media or checking the individual's phone location and transactional history of their bank accounts. In Sinead's case, the police wanted to look into her background. Did she disappear often? Could her disappearance be classed as typical behaviour? Was she prone to unpredictable actions? Did she have any substance abuse issues? It was the same morning when Akshar reported Sinead as missing that her body was discovered by a group of runners at Adol Woods. Sinead's body had been severely burned and was wrapped in a bed quilt tied together with wire. Her body was still smouldering when it was discovered. 
Shortly after the discovery of Sinead's body, a murder investigation was launched by West Yorkshire Police. The surrounding area, including the car park at the entrance of Adel Woods, was taped off. At the time of discovery, Sinead's body hadn't been identified. Police needed to not only find out how and why she was killed, but they also needed to figure out who this person was. According to the Office for National Statistics, the UK's recognised National Statistical Institute, the most common method of killing in the UK is by a sharp instrument, with 35-40% to 40 of all homicides committed this way in the last 10 years. This is followed by punching or kicking, then strangulation, followed by categories labelled as either other or simply unknown. Homicide by way of burning fluctuates between 1 and 2%. Burning is such a rare method of homicide in the UK that even shootings are more common. Shootings account for between 2 to 7% of all homicides in the UK. This number is so low because handguns were banned in the UK after the Dunblane school massacre in Scotland which occurred in March of 1996. Sinead's murder, if by burning, was therefore seen as extremely rare and very unusual by the police. The body was identified as that of Sinead Wooding after pathologists were able to take a print from her left thumb, one of the only parts of her body not damaged by fire. It was during the post-mortem that Sinead's cause of death was determined. Pathologists confirmed that Sinead's body was set alight after she died, and was therefore not the cause of death. It was during the post-mortem that Sinead's cause of death was determined. Pathologists confirmed that Sinead's body was set alight after she died, and was therefore not the cause of death. The following injuries were found on Sinead's body. Six stab wounds, including one through her windpipe. Blunt force trauma to the head, consistent with the use of a claw hammer. There was a lack of defensive injuries to the hands and arms, indicating that Sinead didn't have the chance to put up a fight and was likely taken by surprise with the attack. The theory put forward by the pathologist was that Sinead had received a blow to the head and was subsequently stabbed. This is the most logical explanation, otherwise Sinead would have tried to defend herself from the knife and likely would have had cuts on her hands and arms. It was therefore determined that Sinead was killed at a separate location and moved to the woods posthumously. The burning of the body was suspected as being an attempt to eradicate any evidence or to even prevent Sinead from being identified. Along with the thumbprint, police found another crucial piece of evidence in the woods near where Sinead's body was found. It was a receipt from a petrol station or gas station on such receipts, the location of the petrol station itself is always printed alongside the purchase amount. Police now realised that petrol was the accelerant used to set Sinead's body alight and the station quoted on the receipt was likely where the killer purchased it from. After obtaining the CCTV footage from the petrol station, police noticed a car driving through Potter Newton late on May 13, 2017, the night before Sinead was reported as missing. The vehicle was a Volkswagen Golf. The car was soon seized by police and sent to be forensically examined. They needed to find out if there were any signs of Sinead being in the car as well as to attempt to identify who was driving. A thorough examination of the vehicle led to forensic experts finding bloodstains on the boot seal of the car, known internationally as the trunk seal. The trunk of a car is known as the boot here in the UK. This rubber seal is installed under the boot lid to prevent vibration, noise and leakage. Blood samples were sent away for DNA analysis. Upon their return, it was confirmed that a full DNA profile match to Sinead Wooding was identified. Although police could now confirm that Sinead was in the Volkswagen Golf, only a small amount of blood was found on the boot seal. The conclusion was therefore that Sinead was likely already dead when her body was placed into the boot of the car. 
The owners of the vehicle were questioned about the CCTV footage, however they had an alibi as to their whereabouts on the evening of May 13th. Police were shocked to learn that the owner had let someone borrow their car on the evening of May 13th. The man who borrowed the car went by the name of Asim Ali, the brother of Sinead's husband, Akshar. After finding out who was driving the car, and the connection between Asim and Akshar, both men were arrested. Despite having two men in custody, police were still none the wiser as to where Sinead was murdered and why. No motive had yet been established. After delving into Sinead and Akshar's marriage, police were made aware that the relationship was, in effect, a facade. It appeared to be perfect on the surface and in the public eye, however, behind closed doors, it was a different story. The most logical place for police to carry out further investigations was Yasmin's house, the location of the party on May 11, 2017. This was the last place Sinead is known to have been and therefore the individuals present at the party were potentially the last ones to see Sinead alive. After questioning all of the guests present at the party, it became clear that the last people to see Sinead before she disappeared were Akshar and Yasmin, as they were all in the kitchen whilst the other guests remained in the living room. Police questioned Yasmin and asked if Sinead did leave the party, to which Yasmin responded that yes, she did. Despite this, police examined Yasmin's kitchen as this was the last known site where Sinead was seen alive. It was therefore being treated as a potential murder site. No traces of blood or DNA were found in the kitchen. It didn't appear as if Sinead had been killed or even assaulted in there. However, after a further, more thorough examination took place, investigators discovered a hidden entrance to a cellar underneath the kitchen. After prizing the hatch open, police estimated a drop of around 8 feet, just short of 2.5 metres, to a concrete floor below. Perhaps this secret location was where Sinead was killed. Blood dogs were brought to the site to investigate the cellar along with a crime scene investigator. There was a large blood stain in the middle of the floor, which appeared to have initially been a pool of blood which had attempted to be cleaned up. Such a large pool of blood indicated that whoever was laying there on the floor had to have been motionless and bleeding out for a good while. The cellar walls were decorated with paint. The lower half of the walls were painted black and the upper half of the walls were painted cream. Investigators noticed that the cream paint looked incredibly clean, as if it had been wiped. Parts of the paint were noticed to have scratch marks, which suggested to investigators that a scourer had been used to clean the walls and remove any traces of blood spatter. The cleanup job was far from effective, however. Spots of blood were present on the wall around the foot of the ladder at the entrance of the cellar. After being tested back at the lab, the blood was identified as belonging to Sinead Wooding. Based on the evidence found, the suspected timeline of events was as follows. Sinead and Akshar argue in Yasmin's kitchen. The loud noise heard by the other guests, including Yasmin, was Akshar attacking Sinead. Yasmin goes into the kitchen and, after discovering what has happened, helps Akshar put Sinead into the cellar. It is assumed that Sinead was either dropped into the cellar or fell whilst the pair were attempting to lower her into it. Sinead was then likely murdered in the cellar on May 12th. She was stabbed six times with a knife and hit on the head at least twice with a claw hammer. Sinead's body was then left in the cellar for two days before being wrapped in a duvet dumped in the woods, doused in petrol, and set alight. Akshar and Yasmin then attempted to clean the cellar to rid it of any evidence. Following the discovery of Sinead's blood in the cellar, Yasmin was arrested along with her roommate Vicky Briggs. When questioned, neither Akshar nor Yasmin admitted to killing Sinead. Akshar and Asim's mother, Akhtar B., 
was also arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender by making arrangements to dispose of Sinead's body. Police now had five people in custody concerning the murder of Sinead Wooding. Akshar Ali, Sinead's husband, Yasmin Ahmed, Sinead and Akshar's friend who is suspected to have been having an affair with Akshar, Asim Ali, Akshar's brother who procured the Volkswagen Golf which was the transporter vehicle, Akhtar B who is Akshar and Asim's mother and Vicky Briggs, Yasmin's roommate. The trial began in November 2017. Both Akshar and Yasmin pleaded not guilty to all charges. Instead, they attempted to blame each other whilst denying any knowledge of Sinead's murder. Akshar told the court that he intended on taking one of his children to Pakistan and had been planning it for a while. He also put forward his theory as to what had happened to Sinead. Akshar theorised that after leaving the party, Sinead had returned to Yasmin's house. She was then killed by Yasmin shortly after. Akshar felt there was no scientific evidence to link him to the crime and the fact that the murder took place at Yasmin's house was enough in his head to justify him placing the blame solely on Yasmin. Yasmin changed her story during the trial and admitted to being involved in the cellar cleanup, stating that she had a motive to get rid of Sinead's body as it was her house after all. It came to light during the trial that Sinead was the victim of domestic abuse. Akshar was controlling, he bullied Sinead, coerced her and used their children as a means to manipulate and control her further. The motive for Sinead's murder was put down to the fact that she had had enough and wanted to leave Akshar. CCTV from the night of May 13th, 2017 was shown in court. It showed Akshar and Yasmin walking along a road near Yasmin's house. This footage is suspected as being taken shortly before they borrowed the Volkswagen Golf, procured unknowingly by Asim Ali, to move Sinead's body from Yasmin's house and dump it in the woods before setting it alight. Both Akshar Ali and Yasmin Ahmed were found guilty of the murder of Sinead Wooding. The pair were both given life sentences with a minimum term of 22 years before they are eligible for parole. Vicky Briggs, Yasmin's roommate, was sentenced to serve four years in prison after being found guilty of assisting an offender by helping to clean up and burn material following the murder. Neither Asim Ali nor Akhtar B were convicted of any wrongdoing. To close this episode, here is an emotional poem that was written about Sinead by her sister, Katie. Always playing with the butterflies, always trying to hide. My beautiful little sister was always by my side. I will always have our memories, I could never say goodbye. Not now, not then, not ever, forever asking the question why. I will always have our memories, no one will ever see. The moon, the light, the sky at night, no one can take them away from me. I will always love you, Shady, and when I feel that breeze, I will look up to the sky at night, I will always have our memories. That was the story of British murderers Akshar Ali and Yasmin Ahmed. I debated calling this episode the murder of Sinead Wooding rather than focusing on the two killers. However, I feel like the majority of this episode focused on the life of Sinead and the struggle she went through, so I'm happy with how it turned out. A lot of my research came from the documentary series Killer in My Village, which is on YouTube. Season 4, episode 6 is the one focusing on Sinead and I've linked the video in this episode's show notes. A common theme discussed throughout this episode was domestic abuse. If you are affected by any of the issues raised during this episode or are experiencing domestic abuse, please visit the website links in the show notes for Refuge Against Domestic Violence and Men's Advice Line UK. For more on British murders, please feel free to check me out on social media. The links for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok and YouTube are all in the show notes. 
You can support the show every month by becoming a Patreon member, where you'll get access to ad-free episodes, my scripts, raw and unedited audio, and more. Memberships start from £1 per month, or you can support the show on a one-off basis by visiting Buy Me A Coffee. The links for both of those are in the episode description. Any and all funds received will go towards researching the show and will help greatly with the hosting costs involved. You can email me on britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear some case suggestions, or if you just want to get in touch, you can do so there or via social media. Finally, if you could leave me a review on iTunes, it would be greatly appreciated. It massively increases the show's exposure and ultimately helps the show grow. For now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.